Uh, I'll do a quick introduction real fast. Uh, welcome tonight. Uh, I'm Casey, part of the Diffractions Collective. So you guys have been attending some of these lectures uh, since March, I believe. Um, tonight I'm going to introduce Mark Duffield. Uh, he's Professor Emeritus as well as uh, former director of the Global Security Center out in the uh, University of Brus Bristol. Um, he does have some humanitarian experience in Khartoum. He's taught in several of these universities. Uh, as well as doing work for Oxfam in Sudan, so uh, we can go into that later. Um, he's come all this way from Bristol as well. Uh, I, I might add that uh, he's working on a publishing right now of the Polity Press, uh, Global Connectivity, uh, Political Stagnation in a Polarization or Polarizing World. That title might be changing as we talk, uh, maybe we'll update yeah, on that. As we talk, yeah. And tonight's uh, Tonight's discussion will be about humanitarian design specifically uh, and mounting a kind of critique of digital humanitarianism as I understand it. Yep. So I'll let him begin and uh, we'll come up to the floor. Okay. Thank, thanks, Casey. Um, and I'd just like to thank Dustin, well, and Casey for um, inviting me here and making this, um, this evening possible. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here. Um, can every, everyone see me? Because I can stand up if, um, if it's better, but I'll, it's probably better to, to sit down, I think. Um, okay. Um, okay, my, my title is Humanitarian Design and the, uh, the Spirit of Capitalism. And for me, this is a, a kind of new aspect to my work. Um, and nowadays especially I, it's unusual um, for academics I think to speak about capitalism or, or at least it was. Um, I think there was a high, historically a high point in the late 1960s and the early 1970s of a very vigorous anti-capitalist critique in the West um, what you could call the, um, the May 68 movement. But since the end of the 1970s, the uh, sustained academic study of capitalism has, has ground to a halt, basically. And through the combined efforts of, I think, many actors, politicians and academics from the left, from the right, uh, from behaviourists to post-structuralists, the economy has become unfashionable. But I think looking around us now, um, perhaps we're realising the consequences of uh, placing capitalism beyond critical scrutiny. Because this, this disappearance of capitalism from the end of the 70s um, was at a time when those far-reaching processes that we often call globalisation, deregulation, privatisation, were helping to fashion the net networked and computer-based new economy that we now experience. And I think it's that this, this absence of capitalism, this theoretical disappearance, is all the more pressing given the social costs of this transformation have started to move quite visibly into the political foreground. Now, my central argument, I think, is, is relatively straightforward. Um, because people, most people at least, um, have to work, whether they want to or not, capitalism has always required a, a set of moral injunctions that justify working. Capitalism has always required a spirit, a spirit of capitalism. Um, and I think this spirit of capitalism can be understood in terms of the relationship it establishes between freedom and security. And historically, freedom was exchanged for security. What I mean by this is that the freedom that one may have enjoyed outside of capitalism was exchanged for that security, whether it was religious, material or existential, 
that capitalism promised for those on the inside. However, since the 1990s and the consolidation of the new libertarian economy, that formula has been reversed. Uh, the contemporary spirit urges us to give up that free, that security that capitalism once provided for an enhanced personal freedom that, so we are assured, now exists on the outside. No longer tied to the world of work and production, this is the unencumbered freedom of consumption and lifestyle choice. Now historically this is a very weak and uncertain spirit of capitalism. It's high on optimism and promise and expectation but offers little security. Now my talk explores what I would call this degraded spirit with reference to humanitarian design in the Global South. Now I think for many that will seem an unusual focus, trying to look at the spirit of capitalism through humanitarian design in the South, but there is an advantage I think. And I think key here is that since colonial times, the Global South, the colonial territories, has always functioned as a laboratory for emerging capitalist relations, new subjectivities and experimental modes of governance. And what I'm going to argue, I'm going to argue that humanitarian design embodies the logic of digital capitalism's near future. So I'm going to look critically at some of the commercial humanitarian objects currently available, things like personal water filtration systems, uh, emergency shelter, uh, therapeutic foods. I'm going to look critically at some of these humanitarian objects from this perspective, from there the perspective that these one can experiment with these objects in the permissive environment of the Global South, but they also tell us something about capitalism's future and the future that it, that it, that it holds. My talk has been inspired by a recent reading of Potansky and Cipello's book, The New Spirit of Capitalism, which was first published in English in 2005. What they argue in this book is that the vigorous anti-capitalist critique of the late 60s, the May 68 critique, was absorbed and recouped in the consolidation of a networked new economy of the 1990s. As the title suggests, the new spirit of capitalism uses Max Weber as a point of departure. Now for Weber, during capitalism's prehistory, the spirit was supplied by post-reformationist Calvinism. Pursuing a secular vocation became a religious duty, and success in creating wealth in this world was a measure of predestination in the next. Important for this talk is the spirit of capitalism that Boltansky and Cipella argue coalesced in the mid 20th century. This spirit focused on the large industrial company at the centre of the Fordist revolution in standardised produ production and the growth of mass consumer society. Rather than the bourgeois owner-entrepreneur, the hero of Fordism was the corporate manager, a key figure in the development of standardised mass consumption. Fordism provided managers and key workers with a good deal of relative security in exchange for their freedom. Public education opened a range of industrial apprenticeship 
and professional career openings and social mobility was taken as given. There was also a strong intergenerational bond. Climbing pump company pay scales maps the ageing process and importantly in many countries the house mortgage finance cycle. Home ownership joined company pensions to supplement support from the welfare state to create what in biopolitical terms can be called welfare Fordism. Importantly large companies played a significant social role apart from subsidised canteens family and community-based social clubs, sports facilities, holiday camps and pensioner activities were all part of this, this uh, milieu. During the Cold War, when the outside world was still a place of political possibility, welfare Fordism was a showcase for the bright future of capitalist mass production. From the inside, however, welfare Fordism didn't, didn't look so good. Compared to today, the late 60s, early 70s was a time of sustained anti-capitalist critique. Global in its reach, this disparate movement embraced intellectuals, students, young workers and immigrants. Besides economic exploitation, the May 68 critique also encompassed existential and gender issues. Its key mobilising terms were alienation, hierarchy, imperialism and not least patriarchy. Through hierarchy, bureaucracy and the massification of behaviour and consumption, the one-dimensional corporate world of capitalism was vigorously accused of stifling individuality, imagination and difference, at the same time as violently imposing itself on the rest of the world. Welfare Fordism also inherited the work-family divide from earlier iterations of capitalism discrimination against women was systematic. Racial segregation in society and the workplace was also widespread. Besides the social critique of Marxism, the May 68 movement was unique in its embrace of the sexual and identity revolutions, women and gay liberation and the struggle for race equality. While the May 68 critique would eventually fall short of revolution, its condemnation of hierarchy while advocating autonomy, creativity and authenticity ironically helped transform Fordism into the neoliberal economy of the 1990s. The irony is that while this transformation, at least in, the case, at least in core companies, gave managers and key workers more autonomy and responsibility. It also allowed capital to recoup its control over production through internalising a new libertarian power that, to paraphrase, paraphrase Nicholas Rose, now governs through freedom. By the mid-1990s, it was already widely accepted that we now live in a network society. Indeed, in a globalised, information-based network world. The key economic analogue underlying this network morphology has been the reorganisation of Fordist companies into post-Fordist corporate global brands. In considering these changes in economic space and time, it may, must be emphasised that they would not have been possible without the extraordinary diffusion and global embedding of digital technologies. 
During the 1990s, capitalism's new economy consolidated as a globally distributed information system. By this time, companies had been radically restructured along functional and spatial lines. Typically, core activities often involving more mobile information, finance and design functions were retained centrally, while ancillary production and service requirements were subcontracted, franchised or rented out to globally, a globally expanding army of territorially rooted companies and immobile workers. Beginning at the end of the 1990s, a further wave of digital embedding, embedded, embedding gathered speed, especially from the mid-2000s. Important here has been the interactive, interactive broadband and the rapid expansion of geolocated individual computers and smart mobile phones. This wave has deepened and locked in the changes I've mentioned. Together with the emergence of a globally complex business logistics, digital embedding has made three things possible. First, the transformation of the physically networked economy of the 1990s in today's, into today's cognitive or digital capitalism. Secondly, completing the shift from standardised Fordist mass consumerism to increasingly personalised and transgressive forms of consumption operating at the cognitive and pre-conscious levels. Finally, these transformations are coterminous with the digital remapping of the global south and the rapid adaptation of smart technology to the low bandwidth and subprime economic conditions encountered. Now, the contemporary spirit of capitalism is structurally different from the past. Historically, freedom was exchanged for security. The libertarian economy reverses this relation. The world of work now provides little security. As well as spatially restructuring and globalising, companies have closed their social clubs, employment has been casualised and the welfare state rolled back. The security that welfare Fordist production once provided has been exchanged for a new spirit of digital capitalism and its new freedom its new right of personalised consumption and endlessly recombinant lifestyle choice. In the interests of streamlining, authenticity and fulfilment, the new spirit seeks to free people from all that would institutionally or culturally deny, entangle or hold them back. Not only the hierarchy and patriarchy of the past any attachment that would slow down life lived as a project. Historically, this is a weak and uncertain spirit of capitalism, high on an expectant narcissism, but, as the present crisis shows, offering little security. Boltansky and Cipello have argued that digital capitalism comes complete with its own forms of exploitation and proletarianisation. Here, I can only outline one of these. Reflecting the spatial displacements characteristic of network morphologies, the new economy is structured around a host of scalable, core periphery, fast, slow, and mobile, immobile, spatial metaphors and registers. The new spiritual hero is the networker. That personal thing able to leverage power and profit from the spatial displacements 
and asymmetries of information inherent to network structures. Boltanski and Cipello call this leverage the mobility differential. And this mobility differential is something that network capitalism has captured. The effect of the new spirit celebration of speed, agility and connectedness has been to devalue those skills or conditions that are territorially entangled or immobile, transferable, interchangeable or cosmopolitan skills, for example, are valued more than fixed, grounded or left behind expertise. For me, this logic goes beyond the economy. I would argue that the mobility differential lends a new understanding to contemporary humanitarianism. The emergence of post-humanist discourse in the global north with the emergence of this post-humanist discourse in the global north, we can, we can see an experimental post-humanitarianism in the south. In distinguishing itself from modernism, post-humanitarianism has called forth a new ontology of disaster. This ontology, I would argue, is materially grounded in the network in network capitalism's capture of the mobility differential. The mobility differential means that mobile, the mobile can impose regressive conditions and uncertainty on the immobile. The mobility differential of global companies, for example, is embodied in their appearance of always being on the balance point of leaving, of always being just about to pull out from particular countries or cities. They leverage this differential to wring financial concessions from governments while imposing regressive conditions and cuts on territorially entangled subcontractors and workers. The mobility differential means that global capital can force the slow or immobile to bear the full force of adverse conditions, shortages or market downturns. Global capital is able to subject the territorially entangled to the immediate contingencies of their environment. As capitalism disappears, and ceases to provide security, it is naturalised as an external and autonomous force of nature. Markets are redefined as analogous to the weather, while following the discovery of the Anthropocene, capitalism it, as itself has become a geological force. By extension, global capital has become just as unpredictable uncontrollable and essentially unremarkable as any other force of nature. Critique disappears and theory is decapitated in this naturalisation. Henceforth we just look for signals and alerts and increasingly rely on machines to find patterns in data Henceforth, we are post-human. Now, expecting people to exchange security for the promise of personal freedom, when that freedom is now terrorised by uncertain environmental forces, should have been a hard sell. However, with little resist resistance from academics, since the 1990s, uncertainty a seamlessly colonised our view of the outside world, displacing earlier modernist notions of certainty, predictability and protection. 
rather than being critiqued as a function of how capital exploits its mobility differential, uncertainty instead has become a natural, pro a natural property of the complexity that now characterises a monadic post-human world. Reflecting the threat to personal consumer freedom posed by a naturalised and imminent uncertainty, a postmodern ontology of disaster has emerged. Disaster has been given a defining role in the emergence of life, the development of history and society, and according to how humans respond to the Anthropocene, whether they have a future or not. Central to this ontology is the rise to dominance of an ecology-based resilience thinking, with its trademark view that authentic life always exists on the edge of extinction. Resilience is the probability of being able to escape extinction through developmental evolution. Now, along the global north-south interface, there are important mobile, immobile, that is, international, national contradictions shaping how this ontology is being implemented. In response to external uncertainty, international <coughs> aid workers have withdrawn to the safety of distant fortified aid compounds at the same time as regulating their exposure to outside unpredictability. As for the aid beneficiaries beyond the razor wire, as a set of self-implemented behavioural adaptations to permanent emergency, resilience has been prescribed. The contradiction between those internationals that can circulate and those nationals that must remain in place now structures the security architecture along the north-south interface. This security architecture creates a number of demands for post-humanitarian aid. For example, faced with now hard to reach or contain people there is a need for humanitarian objects and techniques designed for self-administration and self-reporting from a distance. In other words, technologies that are conducive to aid automation and remote management. These technologies, moreover, need to reflect a spirit of capitalism that, however improbably, Give, gives hope to the mobile providers as they celebrate the individual freedom of their immobile beneficiaries combined, con confined to disaster zones. In relation to these spatial and security related demands, digital technology appears wholly fortuitous and liberating. Indeed, in a complex and uncertain world, digital technology appears positively providential. While still, it still draws in a weak sense on the May 68 critique, the face-to-face -face direct humanitarian action of the 1980s has been displaced into a mediated face-to-screen humanitarian action. Technology is a, a prosthesis allowing the digital humanitarians to reach out across the oceans and razor wire to record distant behaviour and shape effects. Cybernetics had the foresight at the moment of its emergence in World War II to have black boxed human, human beliefs, intentions and motivations, declaring them irrelevant to the prediction of future behaviour. All you need is data on past behaviour, the more the better, 
to anticipate the future. Following the present wave of digital embedding and the exponential growth in recorded data, practitioners and activists don't need to be in the world anymore. They can avoid the ground friction and the negativity associated with devalued territorial entanglements and political pushback. Within digital capitalism's crystal palace, a world of exteriorised memory and knowledge comes to them. Post-humanitarian humanitarianism rests upon an acknowledgement of failure. It does not hide that after 60 years of terrestrial development efforts, the global poor still lack access to piped water, stable electricity, proper waste disposal, adequate housing, professional health systems, functional schools, or even reliable banking systems. This candor draws attention to the crisis of crit critical infrastructure. A modernist universal fixed grid of the kind that has a residual presence in the north, either through neglect or deliberate destruction, lies in ruins across the global south. Rebuilding the fixed grid, however, hasn't been a serious international objective for decades, especially now, following the herbicidal destruction unleashed in the Middle East. Humanitarian innovation sidesteps the reconstruction issue by designing objects and te technologies that allow individuals to live off-grid among the ruins, so to speak. Post-humanitarianism seeks to support, from a distance, life in the wild. When I say wild, it is of course a thoroughly artificial wild, an embedded, pervasively recorded and remotely monitored wild. Reflecting Bruno Latour's realist celebration of how the sentiments of design have trumped those of revolution, post-humanitarianism has enthusiastically embraced the design principle. The more objects become disarticulated post-humanist things, things that have a speculative life of their own beyond human experience, the more they are subject to the attentive principles of design. Rather than the Promethean values of building and mastery, reflecting the spirit of personal freedom, design embodies the postmodernist sentiments of care, appropriateness and humility. When faced with the crisis of infrastructure, that post-humanitarianism prefers design to entanglement is, I believe, indicative of a wider political inertia. Climate change, insecurity, pollution, chronic poverty or entrenched interests, any problem, in fact. Technoscience ducks the underlying causes in favour of workarounds, fixes, adaptations or short-term short wins. In other words, manoeuvres that favour design. It's no accident that together, resilience and design provide the zeitgeist of digital capitalism. Since the colonial period, the global north-south interface has functioned as a laboratory for emerging capitalist relations and new modes of governance. Things like prison reform, public health, centralised policing, mass vaccination programmes were often trialled in the colonies. 
Still to escape this role, the global south is now a laboratory for digital capitalism. Leaving aside military intervention, since the 1980s, humanitarianism has been a testbed for emerging relations and subjectivities of the new economy. Humanitarianism's moral authority to bypass sovereign, uh, or, uh, sovereign or privacy constraints is important here. Not only is the crisis of infrastructure much, much deeper in the global south, whole cities having been laid waste, the so-called fragile state is an extreme example of the new biopolitics that gives up security for freedom. The fragile state offers little in the way of infrastructure or security. In this respect, it approximates the wild of an insolvent capitalism's own near future. Free from regulation or legal oversight, the global north-south interface provides a permissive testing ground for the relations and subjectivities of a post-neoliberal future. Forced to choose a word that summarises digital capitalism, rather than its self-image of disruption, I would favour parasitic. The parasitism of post-humanitarianism is evident in how it reaches out to disaster in the global south through information technology. Rather than solving root problems, smart te technology folds downwards, embedding itself and datifying the social inequalities and political disadvantages it encounters. Using innovation to sidestep ground friction, smart technology codifies and re reproduces those inequalities. Reflecting, reflecting its deferment to design, the dominant aesthetic style of post-humanitarianism can be called techno-bucolic. Rather than promising to eradicate poverty, the techno-bucolic praises how techno-science has fabricated a digital infrastructure in the low bandwidth conditions of the global south and populated these reclaimed spaces with an ecosystem of attentive and culturally appropriate humanitarian things. Rather than progress as such, the techno-bucolic celebrates making poverty livable in permanent emergency. Regarding digital infrastructure in a bid to avoid devalued ground entanglements, Google and Facebook are exploring high-endurance balloons and solar-powered drones as a means of connecting off-grid communities. What unites these ventures is that they operate more than 20 kilometres up in the stratosphere, not only well clear of territorial insecurity, the stratosphere, together with the bandwidths they are developing, are unregulated. The stratosphere is the atmospheric equivalent of the piratical high seas, a place to strike out from, to plunder and then disappear back into. The interface of choice in both low bandwidth conditions is the mobile phone. As, as an example of how the techno-bucolic naturalises and reproduces existing inequalities, Facebook is retro-engineering its software to work in low bandwidth conditions. Retrofitting involves lower density graphics, advanced caching techniques and improved batteries for off-grid conditions. The business model involved relies on the now standard parasitic manoeuvre of allowing access to the internet in exchange for user data. To draw out the personalised and nomadic logic of post-humanitarianism, I'll review a few commercial humanitarian objects and technologies. What's striking about the visual presentation of these te commercial technologies is the dominant techno-bucolic aesthetic that underpins them. 
An important innovation has been the celebrated spread of mobile banking systems in low bandwidth rural conditions. In the human humanitarian field, this has enabled an, uh, an accompanying shift from aid in kind, for example, food aid, to a voucher and especially ca cash transfer systems. The chronically poor, for example, when enrolled are eligible for periodic transfers of small amounts of money which can be used for local purchase. In areas of low population density, like northern Kenya, using solar power and biometric readers, the village shop, one of the few built structures in the region, has been leveraged into the role of cash dispenser. Both mobile banking and cash transfer systems are hyped by providers as privileging privileging personal service, weakening patriarchy and providing access to non-community sources of credit. Compared to aid in kind, cash transfer is also argued to reduce costs, simplify logics, logistics, minimise fraud and encourage market-based solutions. It's also remote management friendly. There is a growing interest in emergency shelter as a challenge, it pushes all the right design buttons, ease of erection, sustainable materials, scalable space, reusable, aesthetically pleasing. Apart from the roller barrels just seen, for water there is a growing number of portable filtration systems. This is live straw, allowing individuals to directly purify contaminated water. The sales pitch emphasises portability and purity. As suggested in this strikingly technobucolic image, solar energy technologies provide individual lighting and device charging solutions. Depending on the design, portability is again a selling point, for example, as a way of reducing the risk of theft. For sanitation, there are bio biodegradable sacks that compost faces. Apart from their health benefits, these technologies are sold as providing a source of fertiliser. Again, we see an individual portable workaround in the absence of a fixed grid solution. For nutrition, there is a growing use of commercial therapeutic foods, in this case Plumpy Nut, to counter malnutrition. These pre-packed all-in-one foods can be self-administered in the home and are argued to do away with expensive feeding stations and outside professional help. For health and education, there are an expanding range of self-help apps relating to medicine and education. Of course, we can't leave out drones. Drone delivery systems are also expanding. Potentially, drones are well situated to remote individualised delivery. I've left out the last, to the, to the last, an overarching technology that actually or potentially links most of them. A technology that, given the trend to individualisation, provides the crucial ingredient of personal authentication. The biometric registration of disaster affected populations, the chronically poor and refugees, is now an essential means of identity or authentication. Celebrated as sidestepping the need for traditional paper-based identification and very difficult to forge, biometrics are now a widespread precondition of aid and citizenship entitlement. In Africa alone, millions of people have been fingerprinted or had their irises scanned within the last decade. The current refugee crisis has allowed biometrics to develop as a cross-border tracking and identification tool, the resulting UN databases being freely shared with European security services. Once reserved for criminals, biometric tattooing, as Ogemban has called it, is co currently represents the post-humanitarianism's basic operating system.
This is just a brief overview of some aspects of humanitarian innovation in the Global South. In order to draw out the logic of post-humanitarianism, it's important to visualise these technologies as acting together, as part of a datafied network of human and non-human interaction, and not as standalone objects or platforms. An obvious shared dynamic is the emphasis on personalization, self-administration and portability. Faced with the challenge of an off-grid wild, the logic of post-humanitarianism is to privilege nomad nomadism. This is a post-neoliberal -near nomadism, however, not so much personalized as profiled, a nomadism that is contained behind razor wire and remotely monitored. It's a digital nomadism. In the unlikely conditions of the disaster zone, this logic resonates with the new spirit of capitalism celebration of freedom in terms of personal availability, flexibility and resilience. In relation to post-humanitarian humanitarianism's individualizing logic, it should be emphasized that all of these humanitarian objects have an important secondary market in the global north, that is the outdoor survivalist and camping market. When not deployed in the global south, they are individual camping aids in the north. I would argue that in the permissive subprime economic conditions of the global south, post-humanitarianism represents digital capitalism's displaced exploration of its own conditions of survival. In the laboratory conditions of fragile state, we can detect in the nomadic logic of humanitarian design a post-neoliberal accelerationist vision of personal freedom as pure subjective liquidity. Pure liquidity, the ability to flow around or self-adapt to any obstacle, is digital capitalism's ideal subjectivity for an always available, always visible cyber proletariat. Just so there's no misunderstanding, abstracted from their operational logic, all of these objects and technologies are useful. They serve an immediate purpose. Who here would snatch the life straws from these children? Who would stand up and say, stop them drinking until they have piped water? No one. And I think it's this immediate immediacy of purpose that underpins the, underpins the ambiguity of these technologies. While satisfying an immediate need, they are bound up with a weak and degraded spirit of capitalism. You could object that these technologies are specifically designed for emergency life-saving situations and should not be judged beyond that. This is a valid point. It's also the case, however, that there is no international plan or indeed ability on the part of an insolvent capitalism to reconstruct the ruined landscapes of today's disaster zones. To argue that camping equipment is all that post-humanitarianism has to offer may seem rhetorically trite, but I think it, it goes to the heart of the dilemma. The May 68 critique was displaced into the direct face-to-face -face humanitarian action of the 1980s. This displacement provided solace for the failure of revolution. By being there and serving time on the ground, it erased this guilt of this failure. 
The current displacement into technology-mediated face-to-screen remote management is all the weaker. The sense of solidarity that drove direct action has re been replaced by a politics of emotion that can, uh, and what can be called applied ethics that operates in the, at the immediate level of pure factuality. The staged commercial photograph you can see embodies this degraded philosophy. While nobody would prevent these children drinking, only the immediate humanitarian act is highlighted. The rest of society is black boxed. Who is on the opposite riverbank? What conditions lie upstream? Right now, do those children still have those life straws? Applied ethics is just that. You focus emotionally on a particular enactment or an immediate situation while black boxing the surrounding society and history. Like an electric shock between wires, the emotional charge of post-humanitarianism resides in the instance of remotely uniting the child and the life straw, so expunging the clickers' guilt over that individual's immediate need. This degraded philosophy, its relativism, immediacy and factuality, it's, is what's left when critique disappears. We are left with a degraded spirit, spirit that today finds it difficult even to muster the will to regulate the difference between life and death. Our inability to step back and join the dots, our objection to the idea that worlds exist outside of our own, help conceal the deepening crisis which this of which this impoverishment, impoverished spirit is part. Felt most strongly in those areas left behind in this, uh, and entangled in ground friction, capitalism is now unable to promise even a minimum level of security. It is this failure, I believe, that fuels, fuels the global migration crisis. For decades, the only real chance of development or security has been to physically move. Today that means even swimming or walking to where the last vestiges of protection can be found. Where global capitalism is seen as working, rather than being liberal, it's an authoritarian version that is being admired. While life in the global north clings to the frayed symbols of normality, a sense of disconnection and political failure is palpable. Unless we are happy with populism or, or religious fundamentalism being the only systemic opposition, then critique is needed now and needed more than ever. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like, like to thank you, Mark, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, now, does anybody have any questions for Professor Duffield? Mm -hmm. I asked about the inertia you talked about earlier. Yeah. <clears throat> it's, to me, it always seems overwhelming lately, beyond in the power of an individual to change the course in any way. Mm -hmm. Like global inertia of politics, economics, seem just seem overwhelming. Do you have any solutions or...? Um, yeah, I, I think that that's a very interesting question and I, I, I think it's... Um, it certainly goes to the heart of, I think, my own interests, current interests, and also, you know, underlying the talk as well. 
I think what, what we're seeing, like, and I think the, I mentioned this book by um, Boltanski and Chiapello, The New Spirit of Capitalism, but there are other authors, um, such as Bernard Steibler, the French philosopher, and I think the basic argument is that critique is needed to push things along. You need some sort of outside purchase on the system that can change the system. And this existed in the, what's been called the 68 critique. And although it was calling for revolution, that didn't happen, but it did dismantle Fordism. It did dismantle that Fordism and ironically change it into the sort of neoliberal forms of capitalism um, that we now have. But I think it, it seems that it, that absorption has also been part of this loss of critique with behaviourism has returned, positivism, positivism, empiricism has returned to the academic world. Um, in my view, compared to the 60s and 70s, universities are now quite conservative institutions rather than radical. Um, the whole turn to sort of post-humanist forms of philosophy have problems with politics, they, they don't engage with it. The, the fact that capitalism itself has disappeared. And I think that's the, and we're seeing it in this political inertia. Uh, we have a sort of capitalism that's now become technological and uh, homeostatic almost. Uh, Self-correcting systems that, that is no longer delivering for people. And is being expressed, I think, in Brexit and uh, the Trump vote and in other developments in Europe. I think that it's a sign of, it's the crisis of that inertia. I mean, I, I can't give you a solution to it, um, but I, I think that inertia is a real problem within the system. Um, it's as if elites now, political elites can no longer change the system. Um, maybe we're moving into a, another period of revolution, revolutionary change, radical change. And we're seeing this in, you know, certain political manifestations. Um, but I think that inertia is, 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 is a real problem now. So I'm not, I can't give you an answer to it. I wish I could. <laughs> I wish I could. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Going back. Yeah. It talks about um, this relationship between resilience and design. And um, uh, I just wondered if you think there is a way of like, resting the imperatives of design or the possibilities of design away from, from uh, the forces of capital, if you like. Yeah. Um, in, I mean, I know it's like you're also critiquing the, the sort of weakness of academia and this is tied up with the same thing, I guess. But um, do you think there's any sort of hope in speculative design to actually find possible solutions to, to something? Yeah, I, I think um, I think these ideas are interesting, and uh, I mean, in the course of my talk, in order to make a talk, I've been like provocative. I, 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 I you know claim provocative things. Um, I think the whole, you know, speculative design, speculative realism, um, they're part of the zeitgeist, they're part of our presence. I think we have to, we have to read them and think about them and, for me, trying to interpret what they mean. Um, I mean, in terms of, I, I, the springboard for my remarks was simply you know, um, Bruno Latour's article uh, where he, he kind of praises design replacing revolution and um, in a rather, you know, uh, confrontational way. And I've tried to do the reverse, if you like, um, by, you know, turning it around and pushing it back. Uh, I mean, of course, design principles are, are 
you know, will always be there. Um, I suppose my it's coming back to the to the question about political inertia. Maybe bad design is that which allows political inertia, which uh, allows issues to be sidestepped, to be designed away, rather than confronting the, the, the actual entanglements and, and, and problems. And so maybe there's, you know, we're talking about different philosophies of design or how design is used politically. Maybe we can envisage design that poses problems, mm. that, that confronts problems and doesn't let them be designed away. So I think it's probably an interesting maybe it's symptomatic of, of the times that maybe design becomes an area of, 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 of radical debate whereas in my experience of universities you know international relations sociology and so on have become fairly sterile um, architecture and design seems to be where the debate is in my i think because of the centrality of the the, the technologies to to for me political, deeply political issues. So yeah, I, I was being provocative yeah. in terms of, to, to bring out what is a very interesting area. I think that uh, for me it's like the, the problem, one of the problems with design is that, as you say, like trying to design things away, that's like a big thing, but also this huge focus on materiality and objects rather than the social questions. Yes. Like the design process isn't allowed to impinge on social questions. Yeah. It's, you know, suddenly you become dangerous, like a sort of dangerous becoming a mouse or something. And there's all these precedents for not doing it. Yes. And it's, people find it scary. Sure. Yeah. In your future. Mm -hmm. In the back. That's an interesting question. Um, I think, you know, one, I could probably try and answer in two stages. I, I think um, what's occurred to me in terms of the present is that the, 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 the notion of the military industrial complex is a kind of Cold War idea. It emerges uh, I, I'm in the 50s and 60s, I forget when, um, military industrial complex. And at that period, the military was very a key funder and driver of these uh, of military digital, uh, and, and these early forms of digital technologies, uh, through the RAND Corporation and a lot of other uh, uh, private companies that it funded, the military was funding. I think since the 1990s, it's as if it, uh, under deregulation um, of these geospatial and digital technologies, uh, their privatisation, which has been part of that um, expansion of computers throughout society. To me, it's almost as if it's, it, the pole has reversed in that military, in that industrial military complex, it's now private business that seems to be it seems to be calling the shots with the development of these technologies. It has the expertise and the, and the brains. But I also think that in order to sort of flesh that out more, we have to kind of revisit uh, the notion of the economy, um, because um, I think in this transition from Fordism to post-Fordism and the computerization of society it occurred first in the economy and the economy remains the basis for the computerization 
of society and the collection of data, especially and the shift to personalised consumption. And we know that that's a kind of dual-use technology. It both is the basis of digital capitalism and new forms of proletarization and profit-seeking, but it's also the basis of the security surveillance. It's a dual-use technology. And I kind of think the centrality of the economy to that security technology also now has changed the, the poles of the equation of the military-industrial complex to, to favour the private sector much more. So the military-industrial complex still exists, but I think it's, it's the relations of its poles and identities have shifted. Uh, the, the, this stuff that uh, I've been talking about, I mean, what I wasn't able to bring out, of course, is post-humanitarianism is also the privatisation of humanitarian aid. Um, all of these, these objects and technologies are coming from commercial sectors, um, remote sensing, remote management tools. Um, they're all, if you like, in the private sector. So um, there's a process of kind of digitalisation, privatisation going on, the bedrock of which is consumer capitalism, I think, the economy. Uh, and the the basis of which, so we're getting like economy, economy and security. I think a key, a key terms: economy, security, environment. Uh, these are kind of key registers now. I think um, with the kind of things we're talking about. Do, does that make sense? Absolutely. I think you mentioned in one of your articles also about uh, hypernormalization by Adam Curtis. Maybe you've seen that. Uh, and did you talk a little bit about this and the militarization of something like human terrain analysis and bringing the economy into the military? So it's a really retrospective of the design side. Yeah. Any other questions, comments on this? The academy has changed a lot. Um, I mean, I, I went to university in 1968. That's when I went to university. So I, I, I kind of caught that that period. And I think the universities then, were, in the Western world, they were recognised as areas of autonomy. Um, historically, academics were privileged. Uh, we had grant systems, and it's a kind of paradox of history, if you like. You know, when I was talking about welfare Fordism, um, that kind of job security now, a lot of, I don't feel any nostalgia for it, but some people look back on that modernist period where you could have a job for life and you had a mortgage and things like that, you know. And so, ironically, it kind of, it was also a period that, that, that created this critique, this critique of alienation, of, of, of uh, patriarchy, of all of these things. And I think it was because academics had an autonomy. And I think part of the trend towards neoliberalism is to, is to drive out all of that autonomy. Uh, academics, I'm talking about Britain now, I can't talk about the Czech Republic. You know. Academics have moved on to, you know, a lot have been moved on to short-term contracts. They're now controlled through um, 
having to produce so many books or so many articles a year, um, the jobs regulated to how much you know research money. The job has become much more controlled than what it was 40 or 50 years ago. That autonomy has been squeezed out. Um, but that autonomy then was, was recognised in the New Left movement. I think that's why students were singled out by people like Marcuse and all of that generation as a kind of revolutionary, almost you know, standing in for the working class. That hasn't happened. I, I actually think now the universities, have become, especially in Britain, they've become very conservative. Um, you have to, if in order to, I'm exaggerating somewhat, but you know, in order to get research money as an academic now, you're expected to work on policy relevant research. Um, the idea of just getting research money to do anything like you want, that's disappeared a long time ago. So there's a conservative culture, but it does raise the issue, because I, I think that, that, that problem that you, you pointed out, I don't think it's just the Czech Republic, I think many academic institutions in Britain, students would say that, but it does raise the issue, well, where, where do ideas come from? Who makes the ideas now? If that like autonomy is gone and that that uh, that space of autonomy for this creation, I think that's a very important issue. Um, and you know, I I think in a way it's quite privileged to come here and to be invited here. You know, these like little networks and things exist. You know, and spaces exist, and uh, we can talk, but. Um, it's not as it's not as a good environment as it was. Um, so I think it's, I think you're talking to a, a kind of general problem. I don't want to depress you because you've you've asked about political inertia as well, and uh, <laughs> I'm not really I'm not really being able to um, to kind of cheer you up. I don't. <laughs> I don't have to be cheered up. Okay, that's good. I kind of have a question on that local aspect as well, if I can continue on that. But uh, bringing it back to the Czech perspective uh, for that, uh, I wanted to bring up that the, the spirit of capitalism is something that was interpreted entirely different here in Czech Republic for ever. I mean, we're talking in 68 was a very different era, and it was the, the closure of Dubček reform. And anything that happened in 68 in May was, was left on pause. Yeah. Um, but even before that, uh, going back farther in history, uh, the, the idea of capitalism being based in a Calvinist, Lutheran way. Mm -hmm. uh, first off, Czech lands was, was where Jan Hus was from, and the entire Hussite revolt was, was shot down. So that's, that's already... the Hussite revolt, a yeah. hundred years before Luther, was shot down, okay. and, and failure to have any kind of meaningful reform that decentralized the, the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you've seen a repetition of that, and it just continually being shut down. Um, to modern era today, I mean, many of us probably post-Soviet collapse, uh, Berlin Wall and whatnot. Um, how do you apply any of this north to south uh, change and humanitarianism to west-east relations back in the 90s? Uh, and was there a, is there a continuity uh, as well? Prague is considered something like the mecca of digital nomadism, even mm -hmm. for that, where there is a job security to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't like that in the 90s, so. No. Um, how do you see that as a pattern continuing from then? That's interesting. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't sort of... Um, I don't know the situation here in, in detail. And looking at, you know, north, south, east, west relationships are... Uh, are interesting, but probably they're, they're different from that North South. Um, that laboratory, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it. Well, um, I suppose that you know there was the those you know rapid neoliberal reforms that were implemented post was it ninety eight or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, Loaded question, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can speak in any, any great, you know, uh, profundity to that. I mean, um, I think we've, we're kind of being drawn into a new era of um, new forms of identity that, that is changing established liberal politics. Um, 
you know, and I think we're all part of that. But I don't think I can really answer it any, you know. More on a general note is yeah. okay with that. It probably could be applied more to even the Sharad group countries altogether, but I don't love Czech Republic into too much of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions or comments that anyone would like to bring up? Mm -hmm. I, 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 I think it's part of that, that shift, uh, you know, from Fordism to post-Fordism to, um, and I, I think probably within the planned economies of, um, of Eastern Europe, you had a similar, there was a similar, you know, the, the, the work provided a great deal of security and dismantling that has meant, you know, shifting more and more responsibility onto individuals to sort out, well, everything really, you know, and this notion of social entrepreneurship, I think has become part of that smart, smart uh, aesthetic. Um, but really, I mean, I, I'm astounded in Britain now how much administration, being an individual, requ it, requires, you know, you have to be thinking all the while about, um, you know, are you paying the right money for electricity, should you be changing, should be, when you kind of book a ticket online, you have to do all of the admin yourself, getting your seat, checking your own seat, where everything seems to, it takes so much time now, and I think in the past, all of this would be would have been done by some form of uh, people in, in jobs, but all of, with that automation of all these trades, and I think this idea of, so, uh, of social entrepreneurship, I kind of think it's a positive gloss on on new forms of proletarianisation of people that ha have had to become more and more responsible for every aspect of their own lives. Um, uh, in, in, including right down now to, in, in Britain we have these zero hour contracts and uh, you know the cold called gig economy that's given very fancy names, people are just running around. I mean, you know, it, it's, um, I actually think it, there's problems there you know, ideas of social entrepreneurship are trying to give it a positive spin. Uh, but for a lot of people, I don't think it works. Um, and, you know, does that make sense? Yeah, in a way, uh, I was asking because I attended a conference and people were presenting many projects which might be like a social entrepreneurship and many of them were to India or to oh yeah, like in the yeah, yeah. I think this this kind of thing has it's been a long it's this this idea of when I was saying the South is like a laboratory, you know you can try ideas since the eighties it's all been based on self help, um, self reliance, sustainable development, and my view is is that. For a long time, people have automatically assumed, okay, this is okay for Africa. You know, for some reason, Africans don't want jobs in factories or whatever. They, they're happy with self-help and self-reliance. But I kind of think that's the future of the North. That's where post-neoliberalism is going. These, are, these, are, these have been test beds for that sort of nomadism, that sort of uh, liquidity. Of, of, of relationships 
Now, of course, I'm speaking hypothetically here because people resist it. People don't want that, I think. And, and I think that's where politics and resistance and opposition will come from. I kind of think that the kind of logic that I was arguing existed in these objects is a kind of, it's, a, it's as if digital capitalism is thinking of its ideal situation, where it had a sort of cyber proletariat that was completely liquid, that just went everywhere, flowed everywhere, sorted out all of its own problems, you know, reproduced itself without any input. But of course it's, it's nonsense, it's mythical. It can't happen because people are real and they don't want that, they want other things, you know. But I kind of think that's the tensions that, that, that we have, you know. I think we'll take a couple last questions, if there are any comments. I'm glad you. Um, I'm glad you asked that question, um, because um, I had to leave. I left out a chunk of. I, I tried this talk in in Berlin a few months or two ago, and because I wanted to to focus on the design aspects, so I left out um, a whole chunk by the, the, this French philosopher called uh, Bernard Steigler who talks about um, new forms of proletarianization. Um, I mentioned the, the mobility dis differential where, you know, networkers can exploit the spatial aspects of, of uh, networks. But um, Steigler goes back to, well, classical Greek philosophy and Marx. Um, where proletarianization is equated to ignorance and becoming ignorant. And I think you can see this, for example, in the classical Marxist sense, when they are uh, talking about machine automation, factory automation, the automation of factory work, where the machine absorbs the skills, the gestures, the memories of the skilled worker, because the machine then produces this, this stuff in a mass way. And the skilled worker becomes ignorant. It becomes the unskilled worker. Well, Steigler is, and he calls, this the, he calls these technologies the mnemonic devices, devices that record. And of course, with mobile technologies, these are the classic mnemonic devices that record every gesture, every attitude. And his argument is that we're losing savoir-faire, savoir-vivre. We're, we're, we're forgetting how to live, how to do things, how to remember numbers, how to read maps. And there's a form of proletarianization through these applications. I mean, this is a... People will argue with this notion, but I, I think it's a kind of striking argument um, that that loss of knowledge through automation is something which I think we've kind of slowly sleepwalked into and, and we've, we've kind of uh, just accepted the smart technology bit without kind of realising, you know, what are we, what's being lost, what sort of savoir-faire is being lost through these, uh, through these recording devices. And I kind of think it comes back again to this issue of political inertia. Is that loss also something to do with political inertia? I, I, you know, I, do these things connect up in some way? I, I realise this is a kind of a negative image of technology, um, but I, I find that the, the celebration of these technologies is so pervasive in the media, in the amongst politicians and academics, that you know, um, 
you know, you have to, someone has to say something contradictory, otherwise there is no, everybody thinks it's great. We have to think about it, or to kind of understand yeah. it, we can't just absorb it like this. Yeah, and you can, you can come across as being conservative or a technophile, mm -hmm. um, but maybe it's, if these things are machines, maybe it's more about who owns the algorithms. Uh, maybe this is like, it's not so much being a technophile, it's asking who owns the algorithms, you know, and, and how, how are these algorithms being used and can those algorithms be put to other uses? Uh, you know, I think that's a political issue. It's not like a technophile issue, you know. On the speculative fiction note, uh, there is a Black Mirror episode that covers these kind of mnemonic devices. Anybody watching Black Mirror with the contact mm -hmm. lens that actually records uh, entire experience, okay. so you can record it. It's, some people disconnect, so it's a very similar move away from that. Yeah. Is. Right, uh, any, any last comments, uh, Vito or Dustin, for that? All right, I think we'll close with that. If you guys have any questions, you can ask uh, Dr., uh, uh, Professor Duffield at the end as well. Um, any other last concluding comments, uh, Professor Duffield? No, thank you. Thank you very much for your patience and some, uh, you know, uh, not too hostile questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.